to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which this event's taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So I'm Anne Kavanagh and I'm um, co-direct, this event today is hosted by two bodies, if you like. We like institutes and centres within the university. And I won't explain how they're different, why they're different, or anything like that. But um, Tom has come out as part of the Centre for Research Excellence in Disability and Health, which um, was launched last year um, and has been going for one year. Um, and Tom is one of the associate investigators on that um, centre and I'm one of the co-directors with Gwyneth Llewellyn who's another co-director from uh, Sydney University and a number of our staff and students are also in the audience. Um, I'm also the academic director of the Melbourne Disability Institute which is the other co-host uh, of which uh, Bruce Bonahatty is um, chair, uh, executive chair and director. So we're working together on that. That's a new initiative and um, that started, uh, we launched that in the, at the end of May. So um, before further ado, I'm really delighted uh, to introduce Professor Tom Shakespeare, who um, people from the disability sector no doubt know well. Um, and it's been fantastic to spend the last few days with Tom. Um, Tom is a sociologist and he's a broadcaster and professor of disability research at the University of East Anglia in the UK. I do encourage you to have a listen to some of his podcasts. They're very interesting on a range of topics. He regularly publishes on disability politics and cultures, ethics of genetics for both lay and academic audiences. And he's worked for the World Health Organization uh, previously for five years where he was responsible or part of a team that was responsible for putting together the World Report on Disability and um, the international perspectives on spinal cord injury, as well as a whole lot of other important uh, work uh, internationally for UN agencies. Um, so I welcome Tom to start his talk and, and thank you. Thank you very much, Anne and Gwyneth and Bruce and all my lovely new co colleagues uh, in the CRE. It's a real joy to be with you. Really good, high quality stuff happening here. And thanks uh, to all of you for coming out. I feel I should do uh, a stand-up routine, except standing is not my strong point, or song and dance, which would be even more distressing for you as well as me. Um, so instead, I'll just give you a presentation and uh, suck it up. Um, so I am going to report on a study we did with what in the UK we call personal assistance. So PA stands not for Pennsylvania, but for personal assistant from now on. Um, and I don't mean professional assistant for an executive, I mean some a support worker for disabled people. And I will use the word disabled people because that's what we say in the United Kingdom. Uh, I know you say people with disabilities and there's a long story to those two stories. Um, I'm going to give you findings under the headings of metaphors, boundaries and conflict. Um, and I'm going to try and whiz through so we have time for our esteemed colleagues to tell me what an idiot I am. I, I certainly can try. Uh, I'm not sure if I swallow it, whether it makes any difference. Um, is that better? Thank Brilliant. Um, so, what is personal assistance? Um, in the era of the NDIA, this hopefully will be something that more and more uh, Australians with complex uh, disability will be experiencing. So it's timely that I come and tell you about it. It's where people are given the money themselves Sounds familiar? To employ their own support workers in your language. To promote independent living. To enable people to live in the community like everybody else. To have tasks done. That might be care tasks. It might be cooking, driving, cleaning, um, and supporting in the workplace. A whole range of things. 
not just for people with physical impairments, but for people with sensory impairments, uh, intellectual disabilities, um, children as well as adults, a whole range of folk. So it's a form of cash for care, which is a new innovation, the personalization wave that's gone through Europe and is now reaching your shores, which is about giving people choice and control. And particularly for disability rights folks, this is very exciting because historically, we've either lived in institutions or we've lived with families or friends or volunteers to whom we've had to feel grateful and say thank you. But what we have here is an individual support relationship where we have the money to pay you, just like you pay your plumber, your bus driver, your taxi driver, or anybody else who does a task. And I'm sure you say thank you. I hope you say thank you. But I bet you don't say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I bet you don't feel dependent on that person. It's a cash exchange. You give the money, they do the job. And if they don't do the job, you don't employ them again. And if they don't do it how you like it, you say, no, sorry, you're going to have to redo that. Remember the plumber, it's not what it should have been. So take out emotions, yeah? Very important. And this personal assistant, a new profession, what Vic Finkelstein would have said, a new profession allied to the community, an empowerment profession, a good thing. So in Britain, uh, something like 65,000 disabled people are directly employing uh, 145,000 personal assistants. So it's very significant. These are the most uh, uh, impaired disabled people on average, but it's less than 10% uh, of those jobs. And it's only uh, a little bit over a quarter of people who get uh, direct payments, uh, personal budgets. So it's not a majority experience, but it's a very significant experience. It enables people uh, to participate, to work, to be independent. So we talked to 30 disabled people, 28 personal assistants. And we were really interested. We know this model works. We were really interested in what it felt like for both sides. And our assumption, if we had one, was that we could only uh, empower disabled people if we also did not exploit workers. We wanted both sides of the equation to be happy at the end of the day. Um, we felt that you couldn't take emotions out of this situation. It's a relationship between two or more people. All relationships, duh, that's the word, relationships involve emotion with whoever you are having a professional uh, a relationship with. Maybe not the plumber, but that's because he or she comes and goes. But this is a relationship day in, day out, for weeks, months, or possibly years. And think about your neighbor, your workmate, uh, your family member, uh, somebody who supports you in your daily life. It's a relationship, a complex one. So the first thing to say is that we don't have a, uh, a model for understanding this. Um, it's new. It's only been around 10 or 20 years, and it's unfamiliar. Now, I come from uh, the United Kingdom, as I've expressed before, and uh, I'm sure you don't waste your time on a program called Downton Abbey. Um, uh, but you may be dimly aware that we have had a class system and a servant class in the historical past. And so that is one, for the folk who, who, who have visual impairment, you don't have to see any slides. I will explain everything on the slides. Um, so that is one traditional idea of the personal assistant. Um, but when we reach for metaphors, we might um, apply, uh, reach for others. And metaphors are really important. There's a really important book by uh, Lakoff and Johnson um, uh, uh, called Metaphors to Live By, which is all about the words we use. And think every, almost every phrase we use contains a metaphor. Um, so I am a sociologist, so we talk about social construction. Yeah? Construction is a metaphor. We've just been through a construction out in the square. So we use metaphors. They have implications for the way we think about each other uh, and the way we think about people. Uh, they reveal things. They shed light on how we think. So these are some of the metaphors. I'll run through them. Uh, uh, the robot metaphor, the, the sort of arms and legs metaphor, the staff metaphor, the colleague metaphor, professional metaphor, paid friend, and the family metaphor. And these are all things that our respondents said uh, to explain the person that was in their life. So if you met them and they had a worker with them, they would say, well, this is, they're a bit like my arms and legs. 
Or, you know, I've worked with them so long, they're like a member of the family. Or, well, she's a sort of paid friend, really. Now, none of these are exact. They're all metaphors, because we have no exact model. And also because it's different. Different for different people, different culturally, uh, different for people with different impairments, and probably different depending on who you're working with. But it is important that you try and find a metaphor which is, I think, not disempowering for either side. So, um, uh, for example, the uh, robot metaphor, what does that do? Well, that really dehumanizes the worker, the extension of arms and legs. Well, it, arms and legs don't think, talk, or make decisions on their own. Nor does a robot. Maybe they do that. They didn't. So that dehumanizes, literally, the worker. Family. What about family? We had people saying, ah, oh, they're like my sister, my mum, my daughter. What does that do? Well, that reveals you're very close. Maybe you have no strong boundaries. They're like part of your family. Well, I don't know about your family, but families contain arguments, conflicts, difficulties, divorces, ruptures, <laughs> pretty full on, hot in the sociological terminology, hot relationships. So that might not be a great thing. Um, what about paid friend? Well, that's a contradiction in terms. Um, so the paid friend might be the person who you know, who does stuff for you, and you go, you know what? I can pay you. Why don't I pay you for this? They don't stay your friend. When you start paying somebody for things they do for you, it changes the relationship. Or what about the person who is working for you and becomes a friend? Well, I'll show you in a minute why that might have some problems. We didn't try to determine which was the best way. But I think, uh, because other people, lots of people do it, and some people are happy with any of these options. They're not better or worse. But we felt the most sustainable one was colleague. Um, because all of these, to a greater or lesser extent, contain the idea that there is some social aspect of working together. And we observe people at this uh, relationship. And there is an instrumental aspect. Somebody makes the meals. Somebody drives the car. There's also a social aspect. You chat. You chat about the football. You chat about the weather. You chat about genealogy, for some reason, as I was observing in one, uh, one situation. Um, but with colleagues, um, you probably do do that. But there's a limit, isn't there? There's a, there's a boundary. You don't go so far with colleagues. Sometimes they become great friends, but often you would not let on everything. It's not like a fully friendly relationship. There are boundaries. There's a, there's a home and a work situation. You probably wouldn't meet much outside work. Maybe you'd have a drink after work, but not much more than that, probably. So there's, it's a bounded, safe relationship. And colleagues, frankly, people go on to other jobs, don't they, eventually? So they are limited. And you might lose touch with them. And that's OK. That's fine, because it's about the workplace and the job. So we like colleague, your colleagues on a project, which is the independence of the disabled person. And the other ones, to a greater or lesser extent, had risks for one side or the other. Um, so let me say a little bit uh, uh, um, more about this. Because what was quite interesting was that the disabled people often talked about the friends. But uh, the, work, the PAs, the personal assistants, talked about friendliness. So they were friendly. They weren't necessarily friends. And in terms of boundaries, the uh, disabled people often had no privacy. The workers saw everything, or almost everything. But the um, uh, worker was trying to defend their privacy. They didn't want to share as much. Um, and so there are questions here about how far it's truly reciprocal, truly balanced. Um, and I think one of the aspects that's very important to remember is that the uh, home of the disabled person is the workplace for the worker. So that's interesting. That's different. Different how you would be in your home, how you'd be in somebody else's home. So, if there's conflict can arise if you're not using the same metaphor. Um, these boundaries may be hidden. Um, and we felt that we needed to be more explicit about it. 
that people needed to be clearer about it to avoid the confusions. If you think that you're their friend and they think that you're just a worker, that's not going to work very well. If you think that you're their arms and legs and they think you're a member of the family, that's not going to work very well. And the point is that this was private. There's a quotation here. Disabled people and their attendants are left to grapple with the nature of their relationship privately, away from public conversations about personal assistance. So we don't have very good guidelines for this. We don't talk very much about it. We don't fully understand it. We're trying to cast some light on it. So let me say a little bit about boundaries. Um, now, this is a very informal job. That's great. Um, it's about personal space, bodies, nakedness sometimes, showering. You're doing things together all the time. Sometimes we had people who were working for two weeks on a stretch. So it, it's very intimate. Um, so it's very difficult uh, to be completely professional about that. You know, you're going to end up chatting. You're going to end up becoming informal, becoming friends. And that's good, because you want trust. You want connection. But I think there are risks as well. When somebody's uh, friendly, this quotation says, when they feel they've got their feet under the table, they don't do as much or do things correctly. They try to cut corners. And all of the quotations we're studying with one are disabled people, and all the ones studying with two are personal assistants. Um, and uh, this person says, I'm not saying be rude to them, but you can't be their best mate either. You have to ask them to do things. But if they don't want to do it, or they've done something wrong, you have to say to them, no, I don't want it done like that. So you can see why that's difficult when they become really friendly for either side. Um, and so some people said, look, don't employ friends. Do not employ friends. You'll lose the friendship. It's harder to manage them. As this person says, it's a lot easier to assert professional control over them. Now, I, I had personal assistance 10 years ago when I first became uh, paralyzed. But I, always, I didn't have it 24-7. I had it mainly when I was going away. But I used to like to employ friends, because then I'd have somebody to talk to. I didn't want to make conversation with a total stranger. I found it difficult. Um, but then again, I didn't have 24-7 support. If I had done, I'm sure I would have employed strangers. Do you see what I'm saying there? So um, there are risks. Boundaries. This is a disabled person who's looking after the younger people who were looking after her. So they're saying, I fell into being a little bit too caring. I had people texting me at all hours of the day and night, which is a bit ridiculous. If you're aware that somebody might be struggling with whatever, you have to let them say something about it, but they have to know that you can't do it all the time. So you might think it's not reciprocal, but actually sometimes the disabled person was propping up the emotionally frail, sometimes younger, worker. Um, this one, uh, the relationship became a bit messy in terms of attachment. There weren't clear boundaries. There were times it got very confusing for both parties. It ended mostly because the person was leaving. They were only in the sick country for six months. It was quite traumatic. What I've cut out there, but I'll tell you now, is they fell in, he fell in love with her. She was a student who'd come to work with him, and uh, obviously close and intimate and all the rest of it. And then, he, as you do, fell in love with her. And then there's a whole bit about the airport and tears and trauma. Uh, so it's a risk. You're very close. Of course it can happen. Um, and then for the worker, they go home. This one's saying, I finish my shift, and I think, oh, I won't think about it. It's impossible. I go home and think, oh, she said that today. I wonder what she meant about that. So you get real emotional connection between the worker and the person they're working for. They worry about them. They think about them. They're involved with them in a way that you're generally not with a job. So the informality has implications. It has entanglements. Some people said, were, were trying to keep emotional distance, more professional about it. They were, um, they were doing things by the book, uh, safeguarding. I've, I am bound by legislation that would require me to make a report to someone if I felt something wasn't right. Well, I'll give you the tip. I'm not implying them. Um, but maybe they're right. Maybe it is an important aspect, depending on who you're working with and who you are. But you might not want to employ that person, or you might want to go for that person. You can see these people are much more formal. Um, and here are uh, 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 personal assistants becoming totally overwhelmed by the situation. You're called on too much. You're allowing yourself to be pulled into a situation where you're, at, where you're doing more and more hours. You'll be overwhelmed. 
And this woman said, you have to create a boundary between the friendship role and the professional role. So they're trying to reassert boundaries in this messy, complicated relationship, which has no boundaries built in. Um, and, th and the boundaries are partly about privacy. This person's saying, her life is my life. I don't want my life to be hers. Um, she's not part sharing a part of me. She's sharing herself. I don't want to share myself. I don't want to share with myself with anybody. I don't have to, and I don't want to. And there's, in sociology, there's this concept of emotional labor. And people set limits to that. I mean, a stewardess or a steward on a plane who's always friendly and, hello, how are you? Would you like a champagne? Actually, that's business class. Would you like some Pepsi? <laughs> um, uh, always turn left. Um, uh, they are doing emotional work. And it's very difficult. It's tough. It's exhausting. And you end up feeling inauthentic if you're not careful. Um, people who said, you know, they want me as part of their family. There was a guy who was a, a migrant worker who um, went to Christmas dinner with the, with the disabled person he was supporting and, his mo and their mother. And he didn't want to go, but he felt he had to because he had an emotional bond. So the informality has risks. So the final part, you'll be glad to know, George, uh, 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 I am winding up. Um, uh, the final part is about conflict. Um, and every single person in the study reported having had conflict at some time. And it's not really surprising. You have conflict with your neighbors. You have conflict with your friends, family members, colleagues at work. There's always a bit of conflict. So it would be odd if there wasn't. But I think we need to talk about this conflict as we're starting these new sorts of relationships. Because these conflicts can end up in court. They have ended up in court. Um, these can end up, uh, well, in all sorts of forms of distress, as we'll say. So um, we decided that there was, uh, classified it. There's interpersonal conflict, i.e. between two people. And there's intrapersonal conflict, like inside your inner feelings and, and, and anxieties and so forth. And the conflict can be overt, like it's out there, you're aware of it, or latent. So. Um, uh, this was a, uh, a, a person who'd gone to, the first one, the overt interpersonal. This person had gone to university at the age of 18 and taken with them one of their friends from their neighborhood who had never been to away you know, with young people before and got drunk. This uh, disabled person ended up in a flower bed at some point, drunk. Uh, so just terrible risks and damage. And in the end, they said, look, I've got to let them go. I've got to uh, uh, say no. Um, and uh, it, this quotation here, uh, this uh, PA is sitting there with the open door crying. I was calling to the housekeeper's office to be told to get better control of her because she kept leaving the door open and crying down the corridor. I hate myself, I want to die, I hate being here. Um, so I told her, just go. This is not working for you, it's not working for me. Um, so a total uh, overt interpersonal conflict ends with the ending of the, of the sport ratio. And remember, this person's away at university. They need support, and suddenly, pop, it's all gone broken down. The Leighton um, is a personal assistant. And I'm a bit disappointed because the whole house is disgusting. Now, this woman is in a wheelchair. She's always been in a wheelchair. She can't get upstairs. And yet, the upstairs is minging. I don't know if you've got the first minging. Minging is like smelly, dirty, horrible. Um, I think, hang on a minute, why it's, it's disgusting. And, it's, and she's saying it's because the other carers, the other personal assistants, are not cleaning up. So she's thinking to herself, this is unacceptable. I've got to have a word with the other assistants who are not doing the right job right, because they know that the disabled person is never going to find out about it. So latent interpersonal conflict. Intrapersonal, this is about feelings. Um, so this is a, a, a personal assistant that people can take instead of showing too much gratitude. They take it for granted. That can be annoying. Doing all this work for you just because you can't experience it yourself. You're not realizing how much effort I'm putting in or actually how tiring it is. So it's in her head, or his head, that they're thinking, oh, God, I'm just, you know, you're, not, you're, not, you're taking me for granted. Um, and this is a disabled person saying, I've got a PA who just won't leave his phone, you know, constantly on his phone. Even in a social environment, he'll be on his phone. I don't like it. But there's lots of other stuff he does well. So I have to make a decision, do I call him up on that? So you see, it's, it's in his head. Um, so those are sorts of conflict. And how does conflict occur? And again, you know, we analyzed it and tried to classify it. Uh, procedural, not doing the job right. Or maybe just doing it in a different way to what you would expect. How many here have different um, 
uh, 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 cloths for different cleaning products, and you have them under the sink. Yeah, somebody's nodding. Well, I don't. I don't care. So, you know, if you come around at my house, you're going to be dead disappointed if you're working for me. Um, and you might go, no, I want three different things, and I want you to get this cleaning product. We'd have a conflict. Uh, maybe not a big one, but, um, but... Or you might not do it right. You might be slack, like the other quote. And then there's personal conflict. Um, uh, uh, so um, one person may be homophobic, the other person may be gay, there might be racism. One person may vote for um, Trump, you know, yes, of course do. Um, and one person might not, or Brexit. Brexit's the big one. That would divide you down the, the you know, couldn't have a person who was leave working for me. Um, so personal conflict and proximal conflict. And this is about working with somebody the whole blooming time. I was just in Sydney, I stayed with friends, I stayed with them for five days. And they were very tolerant of my idiosyncrasies. But it's not easy to have a, uh, even a friend staying for five days. Um, think about your mother coming to stay with mine, two days, you're out. Um, uh, and so it's not necessarily you do anything wrong, it's just it's difficult to be with people. So, procedural. This is a person who lies about her qualifications. She comes to work with the daughter of the, of the, of the person we were talking to. Uh, she got through two weeks, it became very apparent she didn't have the training she said she did, because with my daughter, her level of need is so high, you have to have a lot of behavioral tra training and techniques, and she clearly didn't have it. So, couldn't do the job. Um, personal conflict, this is a great one. Uh, a PA, this is a guy saying, PA of mine said, can we go to the cinema? And I said, we can either watch Fifty Shades of Grey or we can watch Birdman. And she went, oh, I'm not watching Fifty Shades of Grey. I was like, why not? And she says, well, it's about rape. And I said, I don't think it is. I think it's about S&M. And she went, no. Nope. And then she went, oh, it's against her values and all the rest of it. And he said, oh, all right, then we'll watch Birdman. And he hated Birdman. And the next day and a few days after, I sat there and thought, should I be letting my PA dictate and choose what I watch? So debate that on the way home. Um, and then uh, proximity. I'm Birdman is a very, very good film. I haven't seen, uh, but it's not an easy film. Um, oh, well, maybe you disagree. Pub afterwards. Um, proximity. This is. I can work with someone for two or three days. It becomes difficult, emotional level, irritable. Um, y y the little mistakes, things they forget to do. People aren't perfect. But when you're with someone too much, it becomes too much. Um, and then, of course, if you're friends harder to sort this out. Um, this quote that I had before, they get slack when they're too friendly. Um, and then if it goes wrong and you have to reprimand somebody, that's difficult. And if it breaks down in your friends, very hard. How can you sack somebody that you're friends with? Um, uh, you can't say what you really mean. You can't necessarily solve the emotional crisis. So it becomes complicated. So you might think it's good to have friends, but actually it might be easier if they're not friends. And we've had this before, the trap of being a bit easy with people. People get a little bit comfortable when they've got their feet under the table. They try to cut corners. So, you know, again, friends not necessarily great. So we thought that we, we divided it into ruptured relationships, um, which was broken and damaged beyond repair, and wounded relationships, which could be healed, um, but needed some work to repair them. And if they weren't healed, might rupture over time. So there was a range of sorts of problems people had. Um, so wounded, um, so you don't know, this person in particular is very contradicted in the communication. She gives you an instruction. After that, she gives you a contrary instruction. She told me, you have to do things without that I say so. And then she says, you shouldn't assume what, I, what to do. I will tell you what to do. So the poor worker, and you've probably all worked with this person, um, doesn't know whether they're coming or going. So they want to try and help, but the communication's not working. So this is wounded. They need to solve this. They need to sit down and get it out and solve it. Ruptured. Here's a thief. She's taking tea bags. I mean, we got other thieves, but this is a person's assistant. She's taking tea bags, of all things. They're in her pocket. I didn't know what to say. And she'd come in and come back out. And I said, I'd see the pile on the side. I said, where did those tea bags go? And she was really frustrated and said, oh, you know me. Um, and because uh, I had them in a tin on the side because I can't reach into the cupboards. I said, no, they're not in the tin. And then she was off the next day. But she was wearing a uniform, and I could see the tea bags poking out the top. I felt like, why didn't I say anything? And then they did a search, and they found lots of things had been stolen. And this is not unusual. We found people, had, 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 because frankly, you're not paying a lot of money. You're not necessarily doing the vetting. You don't know who you're letting in your house. 
Could it be much worse than this? Um, so uh, in this case, stolen lots of things, tons of things, makeup, cream, sunglasses, lots of things. So what happens as a result of this? I've said this already, really. Emotion, pain, conflict, dissatisfaction, um, a l loss of a, a, an assistant, but maybe even a deep sort of worry and a sense of who am I and, and violation and pain. It's, it can be very traumatic. So what can we do? I'm winding up now. Well, obviously, respect difference. That's a bottom line that we should do this and understand that people are all different. To communicate, listen, have times, perhaps during the week. It's like a relationship, ladies and gentlemen, where you uh, clear the air and you talk about what's bothering you in a no-blame way. Um, vet your applicant. Interview them, check them out, take up references. Don't just employ your friends. And have a, a probation period. After a week or two weeks, say, you know, I'm sorry, this really isn't working for me. Better to do that than to be stuck a year down the line with somebody you can't stand. Either way, it might be the disabled person or the worker. Planning and guidance, what you are expected to do. A model contract, a list of tasks. How many different cloths do you have under the sink? <laughs> I expect you to use this cleaning product on alternate Tuesdays. Um, <laughs> well, better to say it. And then, you know, you might say, well, actually, I'm not sure that's necessary. Whatever, you can discuss it. Review it periodically. Um, and a forum for safe conflicts, as I've said, to, so that it's not personal. So you can resolve these issues. Um, and it'd be surprising how little this is done. And I, has the NDIS, NDIA, got a model contract? Has it got any of this in place? Is there any um, uh, infrastructure organization that will help you with this? Is there anybody who would advise you? All of these things, I think, will help this sport relationship go better. So we need something like this, uh, third party neutral help. So in conclusion, personal assistance works, uh, and we need to support people to do it better. It always involves emotion. You can't get rid of it. Boundaries are really important. Let's negotiate them and get them right. There will be conflict. That's quite common. But we need to find ways of resolving it. And if we make it work better, it'll be better for the social care market. There are turnovers in any job, but we need to minimize this. Sometimes, especially in rural and remote areas, it's really difficult to get support workers. So the last thing you want is for it to break down. You haven't got that many choices. You want it to work. And if we could get it right from the start, it might work better. So the match, the difference, maybe have different workers for different days of the week. Maybe make sure one worker doesn't stay on too many hours. Maybe have a room for the workers so they can go and lie down and shut the door uh, by arrangement, and the willingness to listen. Um, we did a MOOC. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. And even Australians can join our MOOC, and they have. And you can find it at futurelearn.com. It's called Personal Assistance in Disability Support. That's me, as you notice on the left. On the, uh, uh, yeah, and on the right is. David Shenton, who's a cartoonist who did the illustrations. It's worth doing for the illustrations alone. And ladies and gentlemen, completely free. We've had 500 people do it the first time, 500 people do it, 450 do it the second time, 80% of them completed the course. Um, and this is who did it. Acknowledge the Economic and Social Research Council and Tom and Andrea, my co-participants. And you know, as I say, uh, uh, personal assistance works. It's great. Uh, everybody loves it. It has dangers. But it can work and usually works absolutely brilliantly. So here's uh, Charlie and Haley. Charlie's my friend with Down syndrome. Haley is his support worker. Um, it's a personal assistance relationship organized by Charlie's mum. He has different personal assistants during the week. And look at that. That is a relationship of, uh, of love and affection. It works for both of them. And that's what we want. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So what we're going to do now is we've um, identified two people who are going to respond to Tom's talk, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. So um, the first person I have great pleasure in introducing is uh, Dr. George Telepurus, who I have... Um, a fellow traveller on the Victorian Disability Advisory Council with me. And uh, he is currently at the Summer Foundation. He's had over 20 years' experience in the disability field, in advocacy, human rights, 
policy and practice, everything really. Um, and he's also on the Victorian NDIS Implementation Task Force. He also writes for The Guardian Australia and um, recently, oh, well probably not so recently now, he was on You Can't Ask That. And if you haven't seen it, you should go back on to uh, the last series of um, You Can't Ask That and you can uh, watch George, who's pretty provocative in that episode, which is great. So thank you, George. Um, would you like to come onto the stage? Both of us, yeah. Uh, where, where is it easiest for you? Um, maybe around here where Tom's sat, I think. Uh -huh. Thank you, Tom, for your wise words. Um, I'm going to disagree with a bit of it, if that's OK. Uh, I think the metaphors are very useful. Um, however, I know that you said that you did not like two of those metaphors, one of them being robotic and one of them being friends. So I might just end up family and friends. I didn't, didn't like friends either, but we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. So uh, I'll just say that uh, I'm speaking as someone with a physical disability. Uh, I know it's different depending on your disability and also your experience as a person um, who might have other uh, things happening in their life. Um, but for me, um, at the start, when I first have a personal assistant, it's really quite robotic and in fact, um, essentially, the new PA needs to be trained to do tasks that require very specific movements and adjustments. Personally, those adjustments uh, are all about making me feel like I'm sitting in the right position or that I'm on the right uh, uh, side or uh, it all is to do with the mechanics of, of my body. And this can really be quite robotic. So that's the fact of it, really. And while the robotic metaphor could sound somewhat dehumanising, I wonder if that is more about the gendered nature of the role. If the majority of PAs were men, imagine that, would we consider it dehumanising to emphasise the physical and functional aspects of what they do? There are all sorts of roles in our society, such as firefighters, removalists, tradespeople, that are valued for that physical function. And we should also apply the same value to the role of PAs. If it wasn't for my PA, I wouldn't be here now. They need to get me up in the morning, dressed, showered, secured into my car, and all of this is really physical work. Training a new PA is often a bit like this. To the right, to the left, a bit more, a bit lower now, harder, higher, lower, Push down harder, harder, not that hard. <laughs> That's it, you've got it. Thank you, well done. As the task is picked up, it becomes second nature. It's a bit like dressing yourself. The PA no longer needs to think about what they're doing, and there is an opportunity for dare I say it, a friendship to develop. I see people look at me thinking, friendship? These are professionals. They're not meant to be your friends. 
The subject is inappropriate or unprofessional, in my view, is to dehumanize kids with disabilities. We have more than income to offer the relationship. Believe it or not, we can offer advice, we can offer support, and in some cases, a hilarious sense of humor. <laughs> of course, this dynamism in the relationship, the fact that it can change from robot to friend, continues. And sometimes, it can turn a bit sour, as friendships and relationships often do. In my personal experience, there is no one in the world more powerful than a PA who is working through Christmas when everyone else is on annual leave. Very, very powerful position. Of course, like all relationships, things can get tense. And I've learned to avoid an argument with a PA just before they are due to wipe my backside. Why do I ask? Well, Unconsciously, of course, they may use a little bit more pressure than they need to. Too far? Oh, too much. All right, so I'll turn now to what's happened in Australia. So the end of the is here. Isn't that awesome, guys? Can we say how great it is that we have an end of the and, and really remember that it's taken us a very, very long time um, to get to where we are today. We have reasonable and necessary support inside in our legislation. And that is absolutely massive for someone like me and others like me and not like me. This is a massive achievement for the disability rights movement and for the current and future generations of people with disabilities. Uh, close to time in Victoria, the government has announced a a uh, proposal for a registration and accreditation scheme for disability support workers. I became involved um, in this because I really wanted to make sure that this policy moved in the right direction for people with disabilities. I wanted to make sure that we could improve the quality of support and at the same time, maintain choice and control for people with disabilities who use assistance. There was a risk at some point that the government would end up deciding who would decide who would write my backside. And I wasn't okay with that. And neither were very many other people with disabilities. So we started a campaign, and that campaign was um, under a group called Action for Choice and Control, and our mantra was, my body, my life, my choice. And we advocated for a voluntary scheme. And this is really important. For people uh, who want choice, it is far more important to be able to uh, choose someone that you're compatible with, uh, someone who you get along with, someone who suits your needs, rather than just someone who may happen to have a particular qualification. 
And this is really important because of an issue that I want to raise, and that is that we're moving to full scale. So we're now 150,000 people in the NDIS. Soon, there's going to be 450,000. And it's going to get harder and harder to find people uh, to work um, as our personal assistants. And so we need to uh, make sure that we're not doing anything that will make it more and more difficult to find suitable workers. Those of us who are dependent on them know that it's already hard enough. So we shouldn't further restrict the workforce. And I also want to add that um, for me, um, it's very important. It, it's not as important to have a certificate through as it is to have a certificate in me. Um, <laughs> I was doing advertising for that, that was quite cute. Um, disability qualifications in Australia um, currently are very problematic. They are delivered, in the most part, by able-bodied people. They bring in people with disabilities as expression guests, as if we are live installations in a science lab. We need courses to be developed and delivered by people with disabilities. No other sector would find the current situation acceptable. Imagine women's studies being delivered by a bunch of men. Why should we expect anything less? with disabilities. I will end with another word of caution. While increasing the skills, knowledge, pay, and working conditions of support workers is essential for the NDIs to succeed, what we don't want is a workforce that is professionalized to a point where the choice and control of people with disabilities is diminished. Disability care has a dark history of institutionalization, where our lives were controlled by so-called professionals who made decisions about us without us. We will only realize the promise of the NDIS if we stay true to the principle of people with disabilities being in charge and in control of how and by whom we are supported. We must scrutinize all efforts to regulate our choices, remembering that it was not long ago when our lives were controlled by others all in the name of keeping us safe. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. That was uh, fantastic, George. Thank you very much. So um, we're going to have an opportunity, of course, for Tom to respond to George and, and so forth after this, but we're going to move on to our next respondent, which is Professor David Haywood, who is Director of the uh, Future Social Services Service Institute, uh, which is a collaboration between uh, VCOS, Victorian Council, of oh, Victorian, <laughs> God, I'm not going to, I've made a mistake, so just forget that, but just VCOS. Everyone knows what VCOS is. And if you don't, look it up. And RMIT, um, the, that institute aims to produce training, education, information, research to support a highly skilled, paid and unpaid social sector workforce. Um, 
He's, uh, he's also been on the board of the directors of Melbourne uh, Health and a lifelong member, a life member of VCOS in um, recognition of his three decades of policy advice, education and training uh, in the not-for-profit sector. So, thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And if I could just begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Um, Tom, thank you very much for a brilliant um, speech and talk. And I was fortunate enough before the, uh, the talk to have your slides, so I was able to see what it was we were going to say. And I can't tell you how happy I was to receive them, but I will explain why in the next few minutes. So the Future Social Service Institute that I head up was established on the, uh, around a simple concept. Um, and it wasn't just around disability or disability workforce, but that if you look at the figures on the projected growth of the workforce in Australia over the next five years, the most staggering thing to come out of it is that there's going to be a huge growth in healthcare and social assistance. Now, social assistance, people think it's health. It's not just health. It's social assistance. So that's disability. Um, that's childcare. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's a whole lot of allied uh, pro professionals that are connected up with um, aged care, with disability. Um, it, so it's broad. So it's, health sort of broadly takes up about a, half of that 250,000. The other half of it is the social sector. If you look at what politicians say and all of the public publicity about job growth, jobs growth, it's not this sector that's referred to. If you look at the pictures, it's people with hard hats or with white coats on. It's STEM, uh, uh, science, techno uh, technology, engineering and maths. Um, it's to do with computers or IT or construction, big buildings, big bridges. But the figures are really staggering and uh, the growth of the social sector workforce it hasn't, isn't just projected for the next five years, it's actually something that's been occurring all the way back to the 1980s. So it's a long-term trend. It's grown as a percentage of the workforce from 8% to 14%. So our job is to try and think of what will be the qualifications and the training that's needed for that workforce for the future. Because you know what? It's so far poorly recognised. Most of it is poorly recognised. The qualifications have been developed in the last century and so there's been some really telling criticisms of people that have been trained up with some of the Certificate 3 and Certificate 4s. As George said, um, having a certificate or a diploma is a bad predictor of whether or not the person you employ is going to treat you very well or not. What is, isn't, that a, isn't that a staggering indictment of the qualification? Don't you think that somebody could have a bit of paper, it's taken them six, nine months, two years to pick up, and they treat you badly? Now, for me, that tells you that the curriculum is terrible doesn't it? The curriculum's terrible. The current response, incidentally, is not to say the curriculum is terrible, it's to, it's to say let's screen people before they do the terrible curriculum. It's the wrong way around. So ideally what should happen when you do education and training, the crucial thing is you pick up the values that are crucial to what it is you're about to do. So anyway, our mission is to try and grow this workforce for the future. Now when you look across the different sectors, Aged care, I'm not sure if you're aware of the growth of the aged care workforce that's projected, but it's something like 350,000 today to 1 million by 2050. Massive. In Victoria, we've had the um, Royal Commission into Family Violence. One, $1 billion spending program by the Victorian government. Again, massive growth in the family violence workforce. Um, and in family violence, the Victorian government is committed to a gold-plated workforce. John Pilars, who is a professor here at, at uh, Melbourne University, is doing a review of the aged care workforce. And his conclusion is that, surprise, surprise, terribly paid, undervalued, very poor status, and what that's doing, it's going to create a crisis. So he's recommending a massive change in pay conditions. Um, and you know what it's going to do? It's going to pull people into that sector. Once that happens, and it will happen, like with family violence, you're going to get a pulling into that workforce. If it does become gold-plated, pay rates go up, recognition goes up, it becomes seen as a profession and a career. And from my point of view, the thing that I'm terribly worried about is that in the midst of these other changes, where if you look across this social service workforce, if one area is left unattended to, it's going to struggle to pick up the workforce that it needs. And the one that I'm really worried about is disability. 
I'm really worried. So we've been trying to recruit students, young students, to do our disability certificates. And we've provided scholarships so they don't have to pay a cent. Uh, the way that the vocational education system has developed over the last uh, 10 years, students pay and they can pay a lot of money to do a certificate. So we've got scholarships and we've struggled to get students to want to do the certificates. So when we've got, so that tells me that yes, we are looking at potentially a workforce crisis into the future. And the other thing that's clear from the students and our principle is co-design. So we want people with disability to be centrally involved in the design of the curriculum. We, don't, we want them to be teachers. We want them to be in the classroom. Um, but it's actually really difficult to, to achieve that for a variety of reasons. I was saying to Tom on Monday at a round table that being a, um, a disabled person doesn't, won't get you a Guernsey as a teacher in a certificate program. You actually have to, even if you've got a degree or a PhD, George knows this, George has a PhD and he can't teach in our certificate programs because he doesn't have another bit of paper called a training, um, uh, a TAE. <laughs> no, you don't, George. But you don't have the training and assessment certificate which enables you but to I teach do. certificates. I do. Oh, you do? Oh, well, yeah. that's great, George. But if you didn't, you couldn't do it. And I can't teach the students either because I have a PhD. Um, so the... the um, but I don't have that particular certificate, so it's all crazy. And what we're trying to do is, through a co-design process, improve the curriculum. And the feedback from the students is that the bit that they love is that the more that they interact with people with disability, either in a setting or in the classroom, they really love it. So that's, um, that's our mission. The thing that we've discovered about disability work, it's pretty much captured beautifully by Tom's slides. How complex is that set of relationships he's just described? Think about the skills and the abilities that, that are needed to negotiate. Think about the skills and abilities that are required to touch somebody else or have somebody else touch you. Think about the things that can go wrong. Um, there's ethics involved. There's enormously complex sets of decisions and processes involved. And do you know what? Sadly, the curriculum misses all of that at the moment. The certificate three, certificate four, all of that is out of the curriculum. It's very heavily weighted towards compliance. It's boring. The students don't like it. So you get something like across Australia, 10,000 students start the certificates. Uh, sorry, 30,000 start, 10,000 finish. Isn't that a terrible indictment? that so many people drop out. And the, the brilliance of your side, so on, on Sunday night I was writing up some material, Tom, and I was thinking, I need some examples of what it's like, the work is like, to indicate the complexity of the work and why it needs to be much more highly valued. And I got your slides. Tessa sent me your slides. I, thought, I can't believe it. Look at what's arrived. So if there's one thing that I, I, I think is a takeaway um, from tonight is please value the work. It is incredib incredibly, it is undervalued, dramatically undervalued at the moment, dramatically undervalued. And I think it is really important that we do find ways of getting careers um, and professions within a broader social service workforce. The other th takeaway that I'd leave you with, as we see the shift in the workforce to this new sector, this is the workforce of the future, I think society is going to change. We've had a very masculine workforce profile in the past doing building things, um, masculinised work. This is a very different set of work involving very different sets of skills. And I think society as a whole is going to, bene as a whole is going to bene benefit enormously from the type of work that is growing. But gee, it's time that it's recognised. <clears throat> um, so with that, Tom, I really don't have a critique of what you had to say. I came to thank you very much for that material that I was able to use in my paper. So thank you. And there with that, I'll... Okay, thank you. Um, if all three speakers um, would like to come to the stage now, um, I haven't talked to them about what I'm going to do, but I thought I would ask Tom if he wanted to respond first to both George. You know, you can grab this seat here, perhaps. Um, if you, uh, George, come up to, yeah, you maybe sit there. Um, if Tom wanted to respond to George and David, um, and then um, we might um, open it up for questions. Sure. Um, I, I think I'm OK. Oh, sure. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm very grateful uh, to, to, to uh, uh, George and David. Those are very helpful contributions. I mean, I, I wasn't saying that you couldn't be friends with your sport worker. I certainly wasn't. Um, uh, I was saying that the concept of paid friend is complicated. And I think that's the thing, to, to, that you, it's, it's something you have to be aware of, not something you just assume will always work. And you know this better than I do. You've had support workers for, for far longer than I have. Um, I think the interesting thing, uh, David, 
that I picked up from the people we interviewed is they didn't want necessarily trained people. They wanted to train them themselves. Um, they, you know, they ran a mile or wheeled a, a mile from mm. nurses and people who thought they knew best and said, oh, no, you shouldn't do it like that. So I think that I'm very glad that you've got co-production in there, co-creation of the courses, and that you've got lots of disabled people coming to talk to your students. I think that's very, very important. Um, and obviously, there are some things, lifting and carrying and stuff, which you do need to know in order to protect your back or to, to get it right, not to drop people using a hoist, whatever it is. But it is the case that disabled people usually have their own way that they want things done. And you know, assuming those are safe, uh, I think that workers should should respect those uh, you know, to the greatest degree possible. So those were just the comments I, I had, and I'm with I'm sure my colleagues very happy to respond to questions as they come up. Add anything to that, um, George or David, at this point? Thank you very much. The one one of the things that's been interesting is. Um, the research that's been done is that, that there's actually quite a large number of participants in the NDIS who say choice isn't big for them. They want stability and that they do are looking for people who are well qualified. So it's kind of like trying to strike a balance between those who want to have the choice to do what, to employ who they want and those who would prefer to also to have people who do have the qualifications. So I don't think that we're in disagreement, but it's just no. that that's other bit that, that needs to be taken into account. And what, what, what we found was that people, um, uh, uh, really enjoyed working as personal assistants. It's really satisfying to empower somebody else. Um, it's flexible. Um, and a lot of the staff that the analysis has been done by um, uh, Karen Christensen in Norway and Britain and ourselves and, and others is that the staff are one, young people and perhaps not clear about what their careers are, trying this out, or maybe students wanting some money. Um, two, migrants. A lot of people who have come to a country for the first time, not any uh, recognized qualifications. You don't necessarily, in, in our country, need qualifications for this. So they, some of them were very overqualified, in fact. But they started here. While they got regularized and settled, then they moved on to careers. And thirdly, uh, uh, women returners uh, might be juggling with some child care, um, might be uh, coming back to work after having children. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily that people did it as a career. They might do it for a phase of their life. And I think that's actually very good. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you've got input, you know, mm -hmm. that people are continuing to come into it. Some of them will stick, and it'll be their career. Others, they'll move on to something else. And you know, that's OK by me. Um, and, and many times, it's students who've done this. I just want to add is that I, um, I think that it's really important that we uh, make sure that people have uh, the support that they might need, because as we um, demonstrated really well, that it can get complicated and that um, for a lot of people it might be their first time when they've um, you know, effectively needed a personal assistant, but they don't really have anyone to um, talk to about you know, what they do when my um, support worker doesn't turn up, like do I just fire them or you know, what, what happens? Um, and in the same respect, I think that um, um, personal assistants might also need um, that support too. So we, we don't really, I think, at the moment, and I know the NDIS um, you know, is, is in its infancy, but there's no real services that are out there now to provide any of that. I, mean, I think that support workers might need supervision. Supervision is a term that a psychologist or counsellor would use. You know, it's somebody to debrief them, really. Somebody to say, yeah, that was the right thing to do, or have you thought about doing it a different way? So some sort of supervision, or maybe meeting as a group. And there are big issues of confidentiality. Most disabled people don't like their support workers meeting as a group. But it may be that you meet with other people who are working for different disabled people. Um, and I think, as you say, disabled people need training and back up and support. And that's where disabled people's organizations come in. They can provide model contracts. They can uh, do the payroll. They can do the recruitment. Not who, but how. Um, and they can form personal assistance user groups. And all of these things are very helpful for sometimes disabled people who are not in the disability movement. They're just disabled. Um, and they don't know how to do it. And they don't know what to do um, and what the boundaries are and, and what works and should they employ a friend and what about their mum and all of these other things. And folk who've been doing it for years and years and years are really good at advice and training and so forth. 
That's fantastic. I'm going to open um, for uh, questions. Uh, we've got some roving mics, one over here and one over here. So if you just put your hand up, um, there's one just here, Tessa. Um, if you want to stand up um, and or or sit down and mention your name and then uh, question, and if there's someone in particular you were. Really, um, to everyone, but thank you so much, Tom. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you after citing you for so many years. Um, my, um, I suppose the issue I have in Australia is that I started my training through the certificates and I found a disparity between RTOs, very much so that the training didn't really get to the root of what it is to be a disability support worker as we called them and really it wasn't classed as a profession it was downgraded to something you would be channeled into if you were unemployed so I was in a class of 25 with people who actually didn't want to be there but they were being funded and most of those disappeared but I did happened to shadow shift one um, young lady who after the five hour shadow shift because my client had a spinal cord injury and I'd been supporting him for six years she said I don't want to do this I thought we we're just going out for coffee <laughs> and this is the problem if you take the other sphere in another social um, practice if you want to be a psychologist, you have to wait five years before you meet a client. But in this area, there's no qualifications and many adverts are in the paper saying, be working in two weeks. I'm still learning. Um, I can't do disability support work anymore. It did fund university, but now I have a back injury because my clients often had inferior equipment because they weren't funded properly. And so I now have to um, be very careful. So I've moved into a different sphere, education with my own programs. Hey, can I just get you to just... Um ask move on to the question because well, we've got, question got a limited is, amount of time sorry sorry questions. i had to give a background because in the years it hasn't changed what can we do to make this a profession more than just a job and also um the professor i'm sorry i didn't get your name are you in um conversation with the health and community services union haksu who is trying to regulate the certificates and get maybe association for as we call it now personal assistance um and a register of those who should not be working with people with a disability or disabled people as tom puts it Thank you. Some brief comments, uh, if you can. Thank you much for the question. I chaired the Victorian Government's um, advisory group looking at the registration and accreditation of disability. George was actually on the advisory panel. Uh, the advisory panel was interesting because we had George and we also had Haksu, the Secretary of the Union. It was a broad range of representatives. And just to give you a secret, I'm actually 35, but the process aged me enormously. Um, <clears throat> but I think I the out on my hair. <laughs> but I think, as George will say, it landed in a really good spot. I think we were able to accommodate the divergent views, and it does settle down to choice. So I think we're going to end up with registration and accreditation. Okay but also for those who are self-managed to end up being able to choose not that path but to choose somebody else. And I think that's a really good thing um, because I think that will work its way through just through um, the power of choice. Yeah, I, I mean, if we're going this way, um, I, I, you know, trade unions sometimes are against the whole personalisation agenda because mm. um, it's seen as privatisation. And I, I don't, I regret that. It's very difficult, though, because we're going from, say, a day centre or residential institution where the workers are identifiable, they're probably all employed by the local authority or the big NGO, to you know, dozens and dozens or thousands and thousands of disabled people in the community, each of whom employed people who may never be in unions at all. So I do think there are some issues there. I, as I said at the start of the talk, do not want to see workers exploited. I want to see them having good paying conditions. Um, what's interesting is that the pay thing is really critical. I think you indicated that. When I first started 10 years ago, when I was paralyzed to have a support worker, personal assistant, I was paying them 10.40 an hour, 10 pounds 40 an hour. 
um, which is something like 17 or 18 dollars, I think. Um, but now, uh, that's 10 years later, um, the pay is eight pounds an hour. So it's actually come down in 10 years, and the cuts to local authorities in the United Kingdom have been achieved on the back of squeezing the pay of workers. And so, of course, it used to be a rather you know, a good job. You wanted to keep it. You wanted to learn how to do it, and you wanted to do well at it because it was well paid. Now, you know, you could work on the checkout in your supermarket. You'd be paid as much, probably less work. Why wouldn't you do that? So it's not, it's so people don't invest in it. They don't think it's a good job to work, uh, to, 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 to try and do well at. And that's a real shame. And I know at the moment, you know, you, you perhaps the envelope for NDIS is sufficient. But going forward, I hope that you preserve the importance of care support work. It's so important in our society. It's not very well valued. And I think we'd all agree on this platform that we really need to invest in it. Uh, yeah, I think it's really interesting the comment that you made where you said that, um, that, that people uh, were doing it because um, they were on, um, on the benefits and they needed to um, attend the course to receive them. And um, I think the sad thing is, and um, it, it also reflects on what um, David said earlier, is that we need to be honest and, and recognise that uh, this isn't the sort of work that everyone wants to do. And I think that we're afraid to even say that, because we think that we're sort of um, saying the wrong thing um, around or something that's, that's really not meant to be said. But um, I think it's OK to, to recognise that it's not for everyone and, and that we actually um, need to think about, well, who does you know, want to do this work? Where are they and how do we find them and get them working? Like, you know, we just need, we need people, we need them quickly. Um, and, you know, obvious controversial um, to say that maybe we do need to look at our, our immigration um, laws and say maybe we do need to um, bring people in from overseas uh, to, to do that work. I know it's not popular um, and I know that people are freaking out, blown out, um, but it's unfortunately um, very, very tough to find people. Okay, there was one, there's one question over here. Elisa Hill, autism researcher, parent of a child with severe disability. Um, this, this was really interesting hearing from Professor Shakespeare and also George just now. How do you match up the right workers for um, your needs? Is there anything available in the UK or here, like dating sites on, on the web, that's really simple and is, you know, really easy to use? I know there are other more complex sites. Is there anything? Yeah, I'll, I can put, oh, sorry, So for, just quickly from the UK, um, many places do uh, personal assistance registers. Um, so uh, disabled people's organisations uh, do run registers. And I guess people would say what their previous experience was. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but a lot of people recruit through things like Gumtree and the big issue and putting up uh, adverts. And so it's still very haphazard. So I think there needs to be more and better registers. Uh, there's a thing in London called PA Pool, and that will, you know, people try to match, like you say, at dating. But I think you need to have a really good interview and a good recruitment process in order to, because it's all very well, as we've, anybody who's done a dating website, you know, until you meet them, you know, you don't really know if you fancy them. Um, and, uh, and they lie, they lie. <laughs> <laughs> not, not personally. <laughs> Uh, in Australia, there is, uh, it's interesting because the NDIS, the NDIS has um, given the opportunity for new services to develop and emerge, and we know that the, the more, the, some of the fastest growing services are the ones that have that matching um, approach. So there is um, an organisation called Higher Up where you can go online and basically, it is like a dating website, you know, they, the, the, the home page says, I like to sing, or I like to play the piano. Um, and so that, that is effectively um, a very successful um, business model. And, and what they will do is they will take care of the 
uh, financial aspects, the insurances and and the, the, the payroll, but you're responsible to um, to train your support workers and and choose them. So there are emerging um, technologies and, and services in Australia. One of the things we did in our MOOC, which is for both disabled people and workers, is that one of the things in it is what sort of person are you? Um, and to really have a sort of, uh, what's the word, a self-interrogation aspect of saying, well, am I? What is important to me? Is it important to be neat? Is it important to be on time? Or do I prefer mornings to evenings and all the rest of it? And I think knowing yourself better as a worker or as a disabled person helps. And how do I manage conflict? Am I, and we've got a conflict sort of tool. Am I a turtle, a shark, a... Uh, <laughs> ostrich? Yeah, there are these different ways. I mean, it's a standard tool. Everybody's seen it as to the different ways you manage conflict. But knowing more about yourself will help in the PA or any care or work relationship. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. I just want to say that with the MOOC, if you didn't get the website address, we'll make sure we put it on the MDI and the CRE website so you can go to them um, yourself. Um, there's a question here and then there's a question up there. Hi. Um, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk, and it gave a lot of insight into the work I'm doing now, which is at your old job. Well, not your job, but I'm at the Youth Disability Advocacy Service. Oh, hi. Um, so something I was thinking about is uh, a lot of the cases that you described have more to do with support workers or personal assistants that provide assistance with physical, um, with physical things. And I'm thinking more about emotional and psychosocial support, especially for young people um, who have been diagnosed with different kinds of mental illness, but also with intellectual disability, learning difficulties, that kind of thing. I was wondering if you could speak to how support workers and people with disabilities might be able to navigate those relationships. I can't say much. Well, I mean, there's, as you know, in, in mental health, there's peer support workers. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, we have done a bit of research on it, but it was out with this project. But in terms of intellectual disability, it's not so very different. It might not be physical tasks, but there's a lot of companionship. Um, there's probably even closer emotional relationships. It is about being a friend or, or, or a paid friend. Um, and there are, there's a literature on that. Um, usually there is a service broker, in the case of Charlie there, it's his mum, uh, but in others it's a professional, not a professional necessarily, but an advocate, who would make sure that the quality was good, because that's the danger, mm. that it, it, George and I can say, no mate, you know, you, you're not working with me anymore, mm. but it might not be so easy, there may be more scope for abuse and, 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 and exploitation when it's somebody with intellectual disability, that's why you need a third party to broker for that. But I, again, I would say that within the NDIA and the new wonderful system that you have, please, please invest in some of those uh, infrastructure and third party people who can really make sure that it works properly. We've heard of registers, we've heard of brokering, we've heard of uh, 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 preventing abuse, we've heard of all of these things. You know, that has to be invested in. And it's not an individual necessarily who pays for that. It should be a, a, a disabled people's organization or a community organization. And the risk outcomes I'm seeing with people with uh, young people with intellectual disability um, is when they actually don't go to a traditional service, um, where they actually um, then think about what are their interests, what communities are they more likely to be, um, you know, want to be a part of, um, and that they hire according to having those shared interests. Um, and it, it works so well. And also because um, for too long, people with intellectual disabilities, they've been trapped in day centres, yeah? And no one wants to hack for the future. We want people in the community, and that will happen um, as a result of matching people with um, yeah, valid roles in the community. Yeah, if you want to work for Charlie, you have to like swimming, <coughs> and you have to like pizza, <coughs> and you have to like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I think those are the three criteria. Never There's a question up there, and uh, I think that might be. Is there are there any more questions after that? Otherwise, we might close with this question because we're getting towards the end. Hi, uh, my name is Heidi Nicholl. I am CEO at Emerge Australia. We work with people with myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, I have a question for Tom, which is, I saw the Nordic model um, go past, whip past on a slide, and I was wondering if they've got it worked out better than we have. Um, well, uh, well, interestingly, the difference between Britain and, and the Nordic countries tends to be that um, in Britain, uh, you're uh, the boss. 
we like to be the boss. And in uh, uh, no uh, Norway and Sweden, they don't stress that as much. They want to be the manager. So it might be that your support worker is employed by a disabled people's organization or a community organization, and you're just managing them. And that seems to be more congenial. There are these sort of care co-ops like Uloba in Norway. In the JAG system in Sweden, you've got loads and loads of people with intellectual disability using support workers as a service broker. But and the big thing in Sweden, like in Britain, is that the hours and the entitlements have been restricted. So the, well, you think the Swedish welfare state is marvelous, but they've actually cut back quite a lot. So there's a lot of conflict in terms of disabled people not getting the hours that they expected, um, so, like in Britain. So you know, the, 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 the hours of your support worker can go down as well as up. So you have to continually fight for the, for the right to, uh, in George's case, part. <laughs> Can I just add something? Um, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to say something else that needs to be said. Um, and that is that um, we talked about personal assistance. Um, in Australia, we, um, and under the NDS, we have um, something called self-management. And effectively, self-management is the um, idea that you are able to uh, make decisions around how to use your funding um, and do it flexibly. And what that means, and this is good, is that people can pay their support workers a lot more than they can probably pay them um, under an, an agency model. And this is good because, not just because of the fact that um, people are underpaid, but you can reward people that you like. So if you've had someone for three or four years, you can put that pay out and you can um, hopefully maintain them um, and this is a really nice feature of um, self-management. Okay. Um, did you have any further comments on that question, David? Otherwise, I might just let each of our speakers, is there any further comments you wanted to make before we closed? Um, I thank you very much for coming, and it's been a great delight to be hosting Tom this week and to have George and David as respondents to this. I, much food for thought. I've, I've learnt a lot tonight, and I'm sure you all have too. So we could thank our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Watch our websites, both of our websites, for more activities. <laughs> <laughs>